Welcome back to Beyond the Stats. We are for the Jazz in the offseason. Got some playoffs still going, which if you guys haven't been checking out, have been some seriously good games, especially that Nuggets-Timberwolves. That series has been exciting, to well, say the least. The, the defending champs, the vets, get pushed against the ropes. They come back and show their colors. Mm -hmm. Got a young stud, Anthony Edwards. It's just... Been fun to watch. Showing leadership abilities and, and man, what a player. It's it's been awesome. But like I said, we the Jazz are in off season mode right now. We just had the draft lottery, which of course in jazz fashion we fell backwards to. And we had a six percent chance of dropping to ten. That was about we had almost the exact same chance of going to the number one pick. So you know, which realistically, for a draft to pull the number one pick, oh, I'm fine. It's not this one. Yeah, it's it's a very Hawks thing to do to finally get the first pick in the draft, and it be this year's draft. It'll be interesting to see what they're going to do. This this could be the year that you know number one is traded and, and just kind of moves all over the place and weird picks all over the place that are, yeah. that are unforeseen. I think I actually think Alexander Starr is a really good fit next to Trey Young. Yeah, he would be or Dejounte Murray. If whoever, I'm pretty sure they're going to trade Murray, not Young, but. Whoever they end up keeping, um, he's. I think he's a really good fit next to them. And and I mean it. It spells another dagger for Kong Wu, right? How long has he been there with somebody blanketing, blanketing him the whole way? I mean, yeah, they brought him on right after they'd offered Capella a big contract. Yep. Um, he's kind of been in those shadows, which was a bummer. I I liked his potential. Yeah. I mean, he's still not that old. So, but yeah, we'll see. Kind of this this draft feels like 2013. <laughs> Anthony Bennett. Um, we've kind of discussed a little bit that yep. it, it you you start to look into that and it, and it, it the similarities are, similarities are there in the sense of like realistically you know Ron Holland could go two could go twelve. <clears throat> That's exactly what <laughs> happens in a draft like this is teams. Because there's not a consensus tier, like last year we had three clear tiers within the lottery, yeah. right? I mean, within the top 10, really. Um, with, without a consensus tier, teams are going to start going more for what they need or trading them away. And so there can be surprises. And, and so all of a sudden, like you said, somebody who on some boards is as high as two could fall all the way to us or yeah. beyond. Right. And, and, in years like this, you're probably not going to find a star, but you can find role players. You know, they, I mean, hell, I think Clay Thompson may have been in the Anthony Bennett draft, which that was a pretty good pick. Um, but there was a lot of good players in that that came out of that draft, but they were scattered throughout the entire draft because it's throwing a dart at that point. We have the tenth pick. There's some players I really like at ten. If we keep that pick. I think us falling to 10 puts us way more likely to trade that pick, especially in a year that is like this, um, where Danny Ainge has openly talked about wanting to go big game hunting this offseason and wanting to make some moves. And then you talked about that if the Wizards draft a wing at three or at two, that opens the door for trades for Danny Athia, which I, I'm very interested in. Pairing a guy like Avia next to Markman and Keontae George. Yeah, a player like that would be fantastic. And there are other players out there who the overlap with another younger player can really <laughs> make them available, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we even talked about the possibility of um, I'm like Herb Jones. Herb Jones. Herb Jones, because he's kind of getting covered up in, in a young kind Trey of the, Murphy, right? It's coming well, up. Well, he's also kind of the odd one out of guys who are going to need to get paid on and that contract team. Contract time's coming up. So there, there are opportunity players like that, and that's not even getting into the salary cap stuff. So it's if if we end up keeping the pick, or I, I guess if we end up still picking, I don't know what what ones are the ones that you think are realistic could fall to us at ten, and that you really like. I think, and, and huge part of it is kind of what we do trades wise and stuff like that on who I like because it, that depends on who we, what we need. Um, I think Dalton Connect could be a very good. I I think he's arguably the best natural, just pure scorer in this draft. 
he reminds me, I was telling you, he reminds me a lot of um, Bogdan Bogdanovich. If, if you watch his Tennessee highlights from last year, it almost feels like you're watching Bogdanovich highlights, which great role player. Yeah. Great role player. He, he's a really good shooter. He's, he's solid defensively. <laughs> he's got a lot of defensive lapses at the same time. But he's got good athleticism, solid athleticism, good length, good size. He's a guy that you can teach and has shown enough things that you can teach him to be a, someone that you don't have to hide on defense. And if we're looking at a, a two to put next to Keontae, he's not a terrible idea or even to come off the bench. Um, so he's someone I'm very interested at 10. If Ron Holland falls to 10, uh, I think you have to take him. I agree. I think you'd have to take him there. Um, Belt and Connect, one of the things that really surprised me about him is just how smooth he is in transition. Kind of like a little bit of a Brandon Miller light. I mean, he's not quite as much of a high flyer and that kind of a prospect, but three-level score, smooth in transition, finishes either hand, really strong to the hole. Um, interesting. That kid out of high school went JC. Yeah. And then Northern Colorado. Yeah, so he's like he's like straight Colorado. So there's a guy I work with um, who played ball high school in um, and JC in Colorado, and this guy lived. He was a town away, and he he went JUCO in Col- Colorado, college in Colorado, and then eventually because of COVID, had a COVID year and went to Tennessee with yeah. him. Yeah, and uh, I mean, got on the big stage and absolutely tore it up. So good for him, man. Mm-hmm. Um, I like part of why I like him. He's a little bit older. He's where we're at, where we're where we've they've discussed where they want to be this next year. He makes the most sense in that sense, in and a guy who's going to come in and can actually make an impact immediately on a team. There's some players, there are a lot of players in this draft who are just young and if are, need three plus years. Yeah, it's true. I mean, that's that's the luxury of of playing out all your years and an extra one in his case, um, that we don't really see that often in the draft. I mean, we had it with Agbaji, right? Yeah. Um, and, and he was, his maturity and, and the way that he handled himself was reflected that very high level. Yep. Um, I've been talking to you quite a bit about Isaiah Collier. And so there, there are some, there's some concerning parts with him, but there are some parts that are absolutely high level. So I, I, we talked to him again today, you know, and so I had some time today and I really dug down into Collier and, and, and I see the intrigue with his offensive side of the game. hundred percent. Um, so coming into the season, he was, it was like him and Ron Holland were yes. in the discussion for one and two, who's going to be the top one coming out. Yeah. I can see the intrigue with his playmaking, with his score, his just ability to score anywhere on the court and stuff like that. Get to the lane the, that will. The problem is he really struggled in the first part of the season. You can't ever put him on the court with Keontae. That's right. He, right, right. He he's not just a bad defender. When you break down like I like I said, I deep dove into this. When you break down um the analytics of him defensively, he was one of the worst defensive players in all of college basketball last year. The concerning part about that to me is obviously the numbers and stuff like that. He also wasn't playing ever matched up against the lead guard on a team because he had Bronny James on his team. And Bronny James was seen as their defensive guy. Once he got in there. Once he got in there. <clears throat> and, it, and it's kind of a tale of two different halves of the season for him. I mean, he, he came out and tried to be Mr. All Everything the first part of the season. And yeah. Fell flat on his face. Had some bad body language, defensive things that really show on film. Um, injured. Came back and had a little bit more of a, of a solid season. To finish it out, um, but the, you're right. The things that are that flash and that are super high level are on the offensive side, and um, and and are like his top, playmaking in college looks like Keontae stuff when he yeah, was flying they, high middle of our season. They are, yeah. His 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 offensive side of the ball is top top three in this draft, yeah. no question. So it's I I've told you that. With us having Keontae, I think it's too much of an overlap, and, and it's not a good pick. But, I agree. But there's there's a, a ton of talent there, and it'd be interesting to see what's really going on there, what the interviews are like. Anyways, he I is, think, 
And and he is somebody that if they are looking to trade and he falls to 10, he very easily could be used as a trade piece at that point too. Because yeah. because Danny Ainge mentioned we will not go into next year with three players under 20, what, 21 years or younger, which means we're either going to draft older players or we're not keeping yeah. these picks. Maybe some moves. But no, I, I 100% I can see why. Looking at him, it's like, man, on the offense side of the court, like, he's so you could see good. that you could see that Will Hardy would would dig that being very much an offensive Hunt, coach. No, yeah. <clears throat> um, there's some others in the range. I mean, the Jacoby Walter, um, he kind of slowed down a little bit as the season went along. Shooting was was a little bit rough. It would be nice if a, a Stefan Castle were to somehow be out there by the time you know, we get to ten. That would be a miracle, but we would take that. Yeah, and and Castle is a guy who'd be really good to put next to Keontae good fit. because he's a dog on the defensive side of the court. That is where he shines. He's yeah. a solid playmaker on the offensive side of the court and just a monster on the defensive side of the court. He's six six, has good size, good. He's got a larger wingspan, which is what you're looking right. for in that type of player. His especially. measurements in the combine were really good. Yes, and so I love his fit next to Keontae. The concern with him, because he's a really good athlete as well, mm -hmm. the concern with him is if he could ever develop any sort of consistent jump shot. Mm -hmm. I love Stefan Castle, but I don't know, looking at his mechanics and all that stuff, if he's someone who could even have a consistent, any sort of like consistency at an open set shot three. And that's concerning with a guy like that. Now, he knows how to win. Right, I mean, he he what he will do what it kind of takes for a team. And I agree with that. that yeah. That's that's he showed that at UConn when he kind of second fiddled on the offensive side of the court and then just freaking gritted it out in the defense side of the court to go win back to back national champions. And Did so, whatever he had to do. Um, really impressive. Uh, his his final two games and the defensive performance that he had on on the uh, the wing from Illinois. The Final Four game, if you really want to see what type of player Castle can give you, go watch the Final Four game. That yeah, He put on a show defensively in that game. Yeah, the game against Illinois was, and I'm not sure if that's the one you're talking about. Yes. Was that the regional final? Yep. Um, the game against Illinois, I mean, he shut down, um, what's his name? Shannon Campbell? Shannon? Mm. Anyways, the, the wing from Illinois, who's, who's highly rated. He'll get drafted. Um, but that was impressive to watch from a true freshman going into college. That, that's pretty rare. And like you said, he was he was playing second fiddle to obviously Donovan Klingon had a lot of pull on that team, but also the Newton, the other guard that was right beside him. And and that's the thing. He arguably was playing the three for a big part of the season. Mm -hmm. And so I think he was out of position playing the three. I think you start Maybe. to see more playmaking if you can put him at the two and more ball handling. Um you know, I, I mentioned Ron Holland. Ron Holland, I've seen him like two or three in drafts, I, uh, mock drafts. I've seen him at 10, 11, 12. Like yeah. legitimately, he's, he's I think, the most bipolar player going into this draft. And um, it's same thing with Castle, just bigger and more athletic. Freak defense, can't shoot, really showed struggles shooting defensive, um, shooting the three ball. But... Um, Defensively, is he's a monster. He's a monster. He's um, once again, we're we're not sure if Will Hardy will play players that can't shoot. That's the question. We're not sure. Um, so I don't know if any of these guys are, are really an option. I mean, if, if you're you're talking about guys, the only guys that can shoot, Dalton I mean, connect. Dalton Connect, the Kentucky guards, but they'll be gone. Um, um, Cody Williams. Cody Williams has good percentage shooting, which I don't like. Cody Williams. I actually be... Tony Jones loves Cody Williams. Tony Jones has talked all nonstop about Cody Williams, and anytime I look at him, it's just he. There's just so many aspects of his game where it's like, can ah, this dude? Can he be? You know, you mentioned it. You're you're banking on the fact that you're hoping he can turn into his brother. That's all you're doing with him. That there's some connected work ethic. Underlying tones work out together off season, right? <laughs> You're hoping that all comes together. So, um, Cody Williams, I mean, on paper and in, in athletic, long, lanky, um, can shoot. Uh, has on, on paper looks great. Be interesting to see 
what happens when they come in. I mean, this is kind of the beauty of the draft and finding out what they are when you get them in the house, right? Yep. So, so there are a number of players there that could drop to us. Um, and, and I think it'll be kind of an adventure, assuming we, we keep our pick. Now, now one of the things that's, that's going on too is, I mean, there's talk about how Danny Ainge, you know, kind of spent a lot of time in the, the Northeast there where Cooper Flag is from. Pretty well, everybody thinks he's the consensus pick for the 2025 draft. It's consensus he, number one. He would be the consensus number one. He'd be number one if right he now. was allowed to come into this he draft, would. which is crazy because he reclassified in high school That's to true. be able to graduate this That's year. True. That's true. I didn't think about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he should be the 2026. That's wow. Um, but there's there's talk that he's supposed to have a lot, you know, and, and we've been on this guy for years, been loving this dude. Um, his calmness, his skills uh, on the dribble, the shot. We were looking at highlights of him and watching video of him about four to six months before he blew up on ESPN, which was cool because talking to people at my work, being able to tell them, like, you know, check out this dude. He's going to be legit. And even some people at my work, like, oh, no, he's 15, 16. Why are we even looking at people like this? And then it was about six months later, ESPN was like, this is the next guy. The guy. And all of them were like, you said this guy. And it's like, well, me and my uncle have been, we've been nonstop talking about this guy. Yeah, so there's there's kind of a connection somewhat, I guess, Danny Ainge, more than just being aware of him, but knowing him, um, I'm not sure to what degree there. Is that something that he would want to go after? Because we would have to not only tank the entire season, we would have to then win the lottery which and that's what I was telling you. I don't see if we went after Cooper Flag. In my opinion, it would be through trade, strictly because you know they've been very adamant that we will not be tanking next season. That that, that it is time to start really putting the pieces together and actually winning ball games. But also, you're hoping you you win the lottery. You, you, it's not just getting one of the worst picks in the league, one of the worst records in the league. It's also getting it to fall your way, which doesn't happen for us that often. Yeah, look at Detroit the last two years. Goodness, they fell again. Yeah, exactly. And and I, I could see, depending on what happens this year, I could see a, a young player, maybe two young players, or a vet and a young player, and like three first-rounders to go after him for first rounders. I could see Danny Ainge doing something like that. If he really thought he was the piece to go on this team, uh, which I'd be happy with. <laughs> I, I huge Cooper flag fan. And the thing is he may not show everything he has in college strictly because his game is more of an NBA style game. He, he, he flourishes in the open, in open space. You don't have as much open space in college. It, it it opens up a lot more in the NBA game, which is why a guy like Paolo Bancaro was a great college player, but as soon as he got in the league, he exploded yeah. because of his style of game. I think Cooper Flag's very similar in that sense. I think that's a good comparison as far as is you'll see the level of patience. Sometimes people are like, why isn't Paolo much more aggressive at, at Duke? Um, I think we'll see that as well. Um, and... The good news is they don't have Roach anymore at Duke. Oh he transferred out. So, so at least he'll be able to touch the ball because, damn, man, I couldn't, I couldn't have, take watching those freaking big have, games, dude. They'll have Proctor coming back. He'll be the, the league guard. That's good. Guard. I, I want to see him in the league. He'll be the league guard, um, I believe, that'll be going into this season for Duke. So, so that's another intriguing thing. And that's, and that's the thing about what's so intriguing with what Danny Ainge has kind of said is, is – what kind of trades, what kind of moves are we going to see them make? I, we could see something crazy happen. Because, I mean, if, if we make a move, get somebody real nice and go big game hunting like he's talking, you know, it's kind of his turn that everybody's bombed onto. Um, we're not going to be anywhere in the Cooper flag talks. Yeah. Right? So so what happens um, if we play Laurie Markinen next year? There's no way we're going to be losing enough games. Yep. That's just that's just reality. So you know, are we going to see some trade that freaking breaks our heart? That would be rough. Yeah. Do and uh, like I said, I think the likelihood of anything like that happening would be more of us doing something this off season, putting together pieces, and then just freaking trading everything. 
for that first pick in the draft. Interesting. Or maybe we talk the Finnish Army into pulling him in for a year. For a year. <laughs> and demanding that he has to stay there yeah. for the whole year. Because because can you imagine? Let's <laughs> let's say let's say Jordan Clarkson, Colin Sexton, and like a first or so or one our first this year, like the tenth pick of the draft for Danny Advia. You put him at the two next to Keontae George, Martin at a three, and stuff like that. And then going into next year, you trade freaking whatever you have to trade, and you go get Cooper Flag, and then you have Keontae George, maybe, Danny Advia, Larry Markinen, Cooper Flag, and then whoever we're playing at the five there. I mean, hell, maybe at that point, because of the way the league's gone, you just freaking play Cooper Flag and Taylor Hendricks together. Yeah, wow. That would be a Absolutely versatile monster group. So Markin and Hendricks and Cooper Flags your, as your three through five. Like they, I just knowing what we know and what we've heard and stuff like that, and what, how we feel about marketing and stuff like, and how they feel about marketing. I would be blown away if it was a marketing trade, hoping that we could go get Cooper Flag, and way more makes sense if we just freaking. Sell the ha- sell everything to get the first pick in the draft to go get him. I just don't know if a, a team would give away their Cooper Flag pick, you know, kind of deal. Even if it's even if it's super hot, just because he's got such a uh, a franchise player for sure uh, aura around him right now. So that'd be interesting to see. Um, I I don't think that Lori Markin and trade would happen. It could, but I don't think it'll happen. If it does, like you said, it's going to have to be unbelievable amounts of money that's that's higher than what the, his perceived value is out on the market. That's what people and, don't understand. And that's and that's <laughs> something that Tony Jones made a great comment on is you know he talked about what it would take to trade him and he and he was like, what did he say? He was he said one or two all stars, all star caliber players plus like three first rounders or something like that. And somebody commented back and they're like, no one's going to ever do that. And he was like, you underestimate how much they don't want to trade him. Yeah. Everyone is technically on the table. Everyone has a price. Lowry marketing to the Utah Jazz right now's price is as if he was a top five player in the NBA. Yeah, that's that's been made pretty clear. So a lot of the normal arguments, if he's not worth that on the market, I agree. He's worth that to our front office. So exactly. That's what that's what it's gonna take to get him out the front door. So that's that's kind of the difference. Um but we're uh we're going through the days of the combine right now. Yeah, the NBA combine, um, and I think they started some of the the scrimmages today. I didn't get a chance to watch those. They did. Kind of um, rough though. The only reason I know is because Bleacher Report was raving about Bronny James scoring four points in sixteen minutes in his scrimmage debut. Uh, wow, cool. I, I yeah. I was yesterday all the stuff coming out about Zach Eady and the way that he was shooting. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard he could go top ten now. Wow. Like I've heard, and that's once again this that's this year. Yeah, that's insane. You, there, you could see everything, which is which is why a, a year like this year, with our second pick, we could get a guy like uh, Ryan Young. Is that his name? The wing super freak wing. I think from Texas. My dad's a big fan of him. You would know as soon as I showed you who it is. I don't remember his name, from but Texas? Well, it might not be Texas, but I think it's Texas. But he's a wing. Freak defensive player. Oh, Ryan Dunn. That yep. the, the law firm of Dunn and Dunn. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. I don't know why I forgot Dunn. Come on, man. <laughs> but but he's a guy that we could get later in the in you know in like the twenty seventh pick or wherever we're drafting with that, or even in the second round. Um, <clears throat> which I thought he was going to go in the lottery earlier on in the season, and so it's like if you can steal a guy like this, if you can get a guy like that later then trading that 10th pick doesn't look that bad, really. Yeah, and his, his shooting yes, the first day yesterday was, was, was quite low, and so there's some people saying that his stock was really hurt, which, fine, come on, fall down to us. Well, um, and, and he's perfect in the sense of we can draft him and throw him in the G League for two years, and it doesn't affect us. Yeah, and I mean, he's, he's like Taylor Hendricks-level athleticism defender and that kind of size and lankiness. Yep. Um, it doesn't have the shot that Taylor Hendricks does, but we're hoping that's something that'll come along as he kind of has grown in college. And so you, if you're tr- wanting to make excuses, there, there it is. Um, I also wouldn't mind a player like uh, Kevin McCuller, who's out of Kansas, who's kind of just a, 
a Swiss Army knife, do everything. Yeah, uh, I mean, he was considered one of the top defenders in in college as well. Can can guard the the two three four. Um, has has a kind of a gritty mid range game and decent shooting. Um, somebody like that, if, if they could fall down to us, and, and I've seen some others that are projected like a, a Bobby Clintman. He was actually projected to us last year too. Okay, he, but he's he's been playing down in the NBL. Um, so I don't know all different kinds of of prospects that are not bad, you know, not bad. Hoping to make the roster and can fill some some role roles at that point. Right. But, but this this draft from last year is is completely different. So yeah, it's this could this could be. I'm hoping this could be a a fun off season for the Jazz to really start to see some pieces come together. Um, we may not see that until the draft, until we kind of start to see how things lay out with that or even free agency. But I would be blown away if we stay with what we have. Um, the way the way they the way they've all talked and all approached this offseason and stuff like that, it would be shocking to me, especially with the collective bargaining agreement and the new collective bargaining agreement coming into effect this offseason it's you're you're going to see probably a super active off season, not just for the jazz, but for the league in general, because of contracts and the way they structure are structured now. So expect to see a super active off season, in my opinion, but uh, you probably have it front run by the jazz. And that's been kind of a consensus talk around the league. So there's been a couple of teams that have really kind of made proactive early moves. I mean, we've been in position for years um, like the Pelicans. They, they Pelicans kind of are Carol another Lewis, one who, Yep, probably enough in with us. Pelicans but, are another team that will probably front run active off season stuff. And there, there's talk of even possibly you know Brandon Ingram being shopped out there, and which I could see, especially with the way that Zion Williamson finally committed to his health and stuff this year, where he finally has kind of gotten over that and taken that next level. And Brandon Ingram was really a letdown for them um, in the playoffs or in the plan. Um, I could see. I wouldn't be surprised. See them get out there and move him a, a, another big salary and see if they can move up some of their young players. Yep. Um, but but for the most part, the majority of the league are past the first apron. Yep. And there's a, a handful of them that are well past the second apron, and there's going to be some panicking. And, and I think that all that takes effect. I mean, last year it was July 1st. Is it the same this year? Is I it believe so. That – the teams can start contacting, kind of making those moves. And so, so that, that's going to be a busy time. And then, I mean, the, the draft is right there. And then July 8th, first day of summer league. Yep. We're going to be there. Which we will be there. I already got it scheduled off. And same. we'll probably do a video that night. Maybe, you know, do something with, with that as well. And, um, you know, see any of you guys come say what's up. Any of the Utah guys, that's, that's a, f- we love off season because because we love all the hype with it and the summer league and seeing the young players. So I'm excited to see what this off season brings for a team that's finally, hopefully, taking the next steps to get past this. The next steps that you need to take for tanking and turning into a championship team. So I don't know. I'm excited to see what happens. We're going to continue to do more videos in the off season. Um, once maybe every three or four weeks, just kind of discussing as as the off season goes with trades, contracts. Um, discuss a little bit of playoffs, those kind of things. But to see how it progresses in the meantime, let us know what your thoughts are on the offseason, who you think we may be drafting and targeting and stuff like that, and who's a good fit for Utah. What players out there make sense? Yeah, it's, it's or, you know, call us an idiot. Sometimes yep. that's the answer. Yeah, that, that is always <laughs> the answer. <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> but You're either, talking to my wife. Yep, either way, let us know, and we'll talk to you guys in a few weeks and kind of – Hopefully prepping for a fun year, finally. I can't take any more half tanks, man. I I can't either. If we do another half tank, I'm going to lose my mind. Yeah, I agree 100%. But let us know what you guys think. Thanks, guys.